Hey everyone, this is Matt with Learn Everything About Design, and today's video, we're doing episode two of our GPZ build series. So just like our first episode, we're gonna have two parts. One is gonna be the what we're doing, why, and how, and then we'll have a step-by-step -step how-to on designing the part. So if you're only interested in designing the part, make sure that you subscribe and check out our next episode. If you wanna learn more about what we're doing, why, and how, then stick around and we'll talk about it in this video. So what are we doing? Well, we're gonna be redesigning the front fender on this bike. I'm not gonna go big into the details of the bike, but we are gonna do a little history lesson on GSX-R, which is the front end that's on this bike. So I have an 89 GSX-R 750 front end, and I've got some random front fender. It wasn't the original GSX-R front fender, but the biggest problem is that it's square. Um, that just doesn't match the profile of the tires that I run on the bike. So I needed to design something that was a bit better, and then I also needed to make it a bit more minimal. So for the history lesson, in 1989, GSX-R 750 was in its second generation. In the US, the 86 and the 87, typically called the slab sides, were extremely popular. Great race bikes, the engine was great, and people loved them. Suzuki instantly started working on the second generation, commonly known as the slingshot, but the problem is they changed the engine. They ended up changing the bore and stroke, and the engine just wasn't as popular on the racetrack. So in 89, the last year for this conventional fork, they ended up going with a low production race homologation version of the GSX-R750, dubbed the GSX-R750 RK. Now that second generation GSX-R and the RR version of it, basically what they did was they went back to the old engine, they stripped it down, fiberglass upper fairing, single seat race tail. It still had a headlight and it had a tail light on the back, but those were just meant to be taken off because it truly was a race bike. And the front fender was a very minimal version of the original. Now there are places where you can buy a replica version of that fender. It's not exactly the same as the original, but the whole point of it was just to minimize the design, simplify the bike, only have the bare essentials on it. And ever since I started designing this bike in my head, um, I started modifying it in like 2002, but I've had the Attack YZF 750 as sort of something in the back of my head that I just love the way it looked. The main reason for that is because that bike was minimal. It had what's considered a floating tail, which is not uncommon these days on modern bikes, but in the 80s and 90s, it just wasn't something you saw. There was a lot of metal, a lot of plastic on the tail sections, and just bikes were getting bigger and bulkier looking. I love that era of motorcycle, the 80s and the 90s, but I always fell in love with that sort of sleek, minimalistic look. And that's what I've wanted to do with this bike ever since. So the front fender, the profile of the tank, the tail that's currently on it, which is like the fifth or sixth one that I've made, it's really important to me that the shape of all those things matches front to rear and that everything is minimal and sleek in its profile. So. That's kind of what we're doing and why, but now we need to talk about how we're doing it. So we're gonna use some basic tools, a 3D printer, of course, but we're gonna be talking about being able to do this with just simple hand measurements or by using more advanced tools like a 3D scanner. The RevoPoint Morocco is my go-to scanner when I'm doing pretty much any project in the garage because I don't need to be tethered to a computer. There are other scanners like the Metro X that will pull out finer details, but for something like this, we don't need it. This is a great scanner and I can capture just the amount of detail that I need to design the front fender. If you don't have a 3D scanner for a traditional or conventional front end like this, you really just need to know where the mounting surface is, the bolt pattern, and then a good idea of the distance that you have to your tire. Now, typically when I start a project like this, if I don't have a 3D scanner available, I'll take those basic measurements, like the height from that plate down to the tire. I'll also get a rough profile of the tire, and then I'll 3D print some sections just to test my measurements. Printing a small section, like a 10 or a 15 millimeter wide piece, just to make sure you're on the right track, can save you a lot of time in the design process. Once we've got the basic measurements in the computer, it's important to note that manually modeling this stuff is gonna be easier than the 3D scan in most cases. Partially because when we have a 3D scan, we really need to worry about the coordinate system, the alignment of the front end, and that's pretty difficult to do. Now I'm taking the scan into quick surface because the RevoScan software doesn't have the ability to align to a coordinate system. If you don't have that, you can always make sure that your first scan 
is going to be in the correct orientation for you. And that means the first frame of your scan will be aligned relative to the orientation of the scanner. Remember that these scanners have IMUs in it, inertial measurement units, and that's gonna track the rotation and position of the scanner. And that's kind of how it works with the tracking algorithm. But getting that first scan in line with the side of the bike, for example, can help you with that coordinate system. It still won't be in the right location left to right, but it will help you get started. So once we have our digital references, then we can move on to the actual design. For me, I've played around with doing this with just traditional surfacing and freeform modeling. And for me, freeform modeling is just the easier way to go. So using some basic tools in freeform modeling, like extruding out and scaling can get a shape like this in just a couple of minutes. Once we've got the basic shape down, then we need to move into more traditional surfacing tools to create the attachment to the bracket uh, and then trim everything up, round it off with fillets, and then thicken it to whatever amount we, we need to do. In most cases, this is gonna be too big to fit on a 3D printer. So I ended up breaking it up directly in the middle of the bolt pattern. So that way I could print two pieces. And then when I bolt them together on the bike, everything is how it should be. In terms of producing a final part, the 3D print could work for a little while, but you're probably gonna get damage especially the way that the layer lines are when you're printing, a good rock or something on the road flying up and hitting the fender could potentially break at the layer line. So what I'm gonna do for this part is use the 3D print as a buck or a mold, and I'll be producing a fiberglass part later on. I'm not gonna do that until the very end for two reasons. One, because getting a clean work area and getting everything done for a tail section, for the front fender, and for other parts that I might need, it's just easier to do it all at once. Um, two, it's really cold in here right now. It's actually 42 degrees in this garage. Um, my hands are very cold. Uh, so it just doesn't make sense for me to do it now. And the third reason is because until I'm completely done with the tail section, uh, updating this gauge pod, finishing the front end, until all of that is done, I don't know if I'm 100% set on the look of everything. I need to see it all together in one place. And once I do, then I'll be able to really know that, okay, I. I've hit the mark or I can go back and say, I need to change or tweak something. Uh, the next episode that we're gonna be doing is this upper triple clamp. That's something that's gonna be uh, out being machined right now. So once we get that final part in, we can finish filming that episode. But we'll be talking about that to raise that front end back up, get a little bit more ground clearance like we talked about in the first episode. So once we've got the final design on the bike as a 3D print and we're happy with everything, then we can move on to doing composites. That's probably gonna be a very um, a later episode where we'll talk more about prepping the parts and um, using things like uh, the PVA release film and waxing and, and pre prepping everything for that. But right now we're still in the design phase and until we're happy with all the, the design part of it, we're not gonna be moving into that. We may consider doing a rear fender, so I'll have to drill and put riv nuts into the swing arm. Um, at least on the bracing part, and I may do a pretty minimal rear fender for this as well. I'm not sure yet. Again, I have to look at the bike as a, a complete package. But that's gonna be it for how we go about doing the front fender. The design of it is really simple, uh, and really the biggest part or challenge of this is getting the initial inputs, the measurements or the 3D scan. That's gonna take the most amount of time. But if you have any questions on this, or if you wanna see the next episode or follow along with the build, make sure that you do subscribe to the channel. If you have any questions on this, please let me know. As always, thanks for watching, and we'll see you in the next one.